Thank you, oatmeal, for looking like something I already ate before I ate you. Thank you, cookie dough, for combining two things I love, dessert and not having to cook dessert. Thank you, stepladders, for being too lazy to reach for your dreams. Thank you, aliens, for being advanced enough to have spaceships, but not advanced enough to wear pants. Thank you, dressing gowns, for basically being garbage bags that you wear over your finest clothes on one of the most important days of your life. Thank you, Uggs, for having the most honest product name. Thank you, hard taco shells, for surviving the long journey from the factory to the supermarket, to my house, to my plate, only to break the moment I put something inside of you. <laughs> I, I, uh, happy Thanksgiving week. We had a lot of fun um, shooting that video at the coffee shop playing off of uh, Jimmy Fallon's thank you notes. I'm, I'm not sure everyone in the coffee shop was as thankful as we were, but uh, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was good time. I am terrible at writing thank you notes. I, I really am. Good. I, was, I thought there might be an amen thrown in there because there's a good chance that I haven't thanked some of you probably for something that I should have thanked you for uh, by now. I, I really am. I'm terrible at it. And I don't know what it is. I, there's a couple of reasons, I think. One is, is I, I'm never sure exactly what to say, right? I, I'm not exactly sure. And the second is that I, I don't know how much to say at times. I, I, I feel like there should be a, a thank you card etiquette out there somewhere that, that would help a, a guy like me because um, it's hard. It's hard to write. Uh, it's hard to write thank you notes. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they have thank you notes for kids that are incredible. Have, have you seen cards like this one? Check this out. Where you just fill in the blanks, right? I mean, how great is that? At what age do you have to stop using cards like that? Because I think, I think this could be incredible. If they had adult versions of this, like when you get married, right, you've got like 300 people that came to your wedding. How great if you had just fill in the blank cards, like dear so-and-so, right, fill in the blank. Thank you so much for the towels, right? Lick it, stamp it, send that thing out. I mean, that's done right there. 300 in no time at all. Or when you have a baby, right? Craziest time in your life. You haven't slept for three months and now you've got like this stack of thank yous that you need to send out. If they had baby versions, it would be incredible. Dear, fill in the blank. Thank you so much for another burp cloth or whatever it is, right? And you just get those things out. Maybe even for anniversaries. How great would that be, right? The dear wife, thank you so much for... Maybe not. Maybe it, uh, maybe it doesn't apply to everything. But I think we've, I think we've cornered the market on something um, incredible here. Just a few months ago before we moved here, we were uh, packing up our place in, uh, in Southern California and, uh, and I heard Laura um, suddenly say, oh wow. And when I hear oh wow, I think oh wow is good, right? I, I'm thinking maybe she found money in something, right? Because who doesn't love to find like, like 10 bucks in, in, a, in an old coat or in a drawer somewhere or whatever. So I'm thinking that, um, or maybe I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe she discovered that the scale has been wrong all of this time by 10 pounds in a good way, right? Like, and all of a sudden we realized, oh wow, that's a fantastic fantastic thing. Or maybe she discovered and, and found a picture of me with hair. There might be one out there. I mean, it, it's been a long time, but, but I, don't know, I had hair at one point in junior high, right? Like there was a, there was a time. So I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is, this is an incredible thing. And uh, it wasn't any of those. It, it turns out that she found a thank you note that we had written but we never actually sent it. When, when you discover that, I don't know if you've ever discovered that before, but there's three questions that come to mind. Um, the first question is, who was it for? The second question is, what was it for? And then the third question that I always ask is, was there money in it? I, I don't know why. There probably shouldn't have been because we were sending it back. But if there's a chance, right, there's free five bucks. I mean, that might be a good thing. Uh, she looked it over and she answered my questions and she said, it was for your grandparents. She said, it was from our wedding. We're gonna celebrate 20 years this summer of us being married. Yay, us. Bad if you didn't send the thank you notes. Uh, and then the third answer was there was no money in it because we were cheap and, and there was no way we were gonna send money. But, but I'm thinking, right, as, as Laura told me this, I'm thinking, well, I don't think there's a statute of limitations on thank you notes. So put a stamp on that bad boy, maybe add Merry Christmas to it and send that thing off, right? And we can kind of cover all of our bases in, in one shot. And Laura turned to me and she said, I don't think that's gonna work. She said, it's for your grandparents, the ones that have already passed away. I thought, oh, 
Yeah, that's not good, right? The only good thing that comes out of that is I know the very first thing I have to do uh, when I get to heaven. I know the Bible says that there are no tears in heaven, but if, if I don't thank her as soon as I get there, there may be mine, right? If you've ever met my grandmother, there's a, there's, a good, there's a good chance. I don't think I'm the only one that struggles with writing thank you notes, right? Can I get an amen to that? Am I the only one that struggles with it? I don't think I am. In fact, I read a story. Um, this is a story I read a while ago, and, and I love it, and I want to share it with you. It's a, it's a short story, um, but it's, such a, it's so powerful with this. It says, when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they witnessed what some say was the greatest miracle that ever happened. On that day, they saw a sight more awesome than all the visions of the prophets combined. The sea split and the water stood like great walls while Israel escaped to freedom on the distant shore. Awesome, but not for everyone. You see, according to ancient rabbinic legend, two people, Reuven and Shimon, hurried along among the crowd crossing through the sea, but they never once looked up. They noticed only the ground beneath their feet was still a little muddy, like a, a beach at low tide. This is terrible, said Reuven. There's mud all over the place. Disgusting, said Shimon. I'm in mud up to my ankles. You know what, replied Reuven. When we were slaves in Egypt, we had to make bricks out of mud just like this. Yeah, yeah, said Shimon. There's no difference between being a slave in Egypt and being free here. And so it went. Reuven and Shimon whining and complaining all the way across the bottom of the sea. For them, there was no miracle, only mud. Their eyes were closed. Even though they walked right through it, they might as well have been asleep. You see, too often in our lives, we miss the miracles that are happening all around us and all we tend to focus on is the mud. Maybe you're a high school student and maybe you made the team, right? Or maybe you made band or maybe you made it into the drama or the musical, but you're not the starter on the team. You're not first chair in the band. You're, you're not, you don't have a starring role, right? In that drama or that musical. Are, are you thankful in that situation? Is it mud or is it a miracle? for you. Maybe you have a 4.0 um, GPA, but you're not the valedictorian. And you graduate college, and, and even though you have this incredibly high GPA, you can't find a job anywhere. Are you thankful? Is, is it mud or is it a miracle? Maybe you get a promotion at work, the one that you've been wanting for a long, long time. But once you get into that role, you recognize quickly that it didn't come with a pay increase. In fact, the only thing that it came with were more responsibilities and, and more hours, mud or miracle. Maybe it's a relationship, right? You're with that guy or that girl. It's your marriage. It's you, you have a child. Your family is growing. Every single one of those things, they're great, but they're so much harder than you ever thought they were going to be. Mud or miracle. Maybe it's a new house or a new car, but not too long after it, all of a sudden comes the, the cost of updating it, of, of fixing it, of keeping it going. Mud or miracle. You see, sometimes life gets really, really muddy. And my guess, my guess is here today that we all know that we could be more thankful we know that if we were more thankful, it would impact a lot of things. It would impact our lives. It would impact and soften our hearts. We know that, that if we were more thankful, it would impact our health. We know if we were more thankful, it would impact the lives of people around us as well. You see, for most of us today, this, is, this message is just a reminder of something that we already know. But for all of us today, it's a habit we're not as good at as we could be. And the reality is we're not as good at as we should be. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Uh, and if you don't, that's okay. You can follow along uh, up on the side screens or you can uh, download the app and you can go there too. And we've got all the notes um, with the message part there. While you're turning to Luke 17, I want to just give you just a little bit of background of, of what's happening um, in this story. Maybe one of the most amazing stories um, that happens in the New Testament. 
Jesus has left Galilee for the last time. It's up in the north and, and he would not be back there before his death. And so he's traveling south towards Jerusalem. And we don't know exactly where Jesus is when this story takes place. All we know is he's somewhere on the border between Galilee and, and Samaria. Now, Galilee was Jewish. Samaria was occupied by Samaritans. Samaritans were despised by Jews. And they were despised by them because they were seen as half-breeds. The Samaritans were, were half Jewish, half Assyrian. And so they weren't seen as purebreds like the Jews. And so there was all kinds of animosity between the two. In fact, if, if Jews in Galilee in the north had to go south, they would cross the Jordan River and walk on the other side and then recross back down on the other side of Samaria because they didn't want to have anything to do with these people. And I love, this really doesn't have much to do with this story, but I love as we set this up, Jesus has no prejudice in this. Jesus, as we're going to see in just a second, he just walks right down the middle. He walks right down the middle between these two people that, that can't stand each other because Jesus loves people. He loves all people. Luke 17, beginning of verse 11, says this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a leper, probably not. So let me describe to you a little bit about what it would look like for someone in, in Jesus' times that, that had this incredible disease. Leprosy starts by damaging the, the small nerves on the skin surface. And what happens as a result is that you lose sensation. And so without the gift of pain, everyday activities become incredibly dangerous. Unnoticed burns or cuts or sores or ulcers can lead to a, a permanent disability because you can't even feel that they're there. Small patches and, and nodules would develop on skin and, and literally parts of your body would become completely unrecognizable. After a while, these sores would begin to, to ulcerate and, and they, would, they would give off this incredibly terrible smell. Due to the inability to detect grit in your eye, blindness was a consequence for many that had leprosy. Uh, you would begin to speak with, with kind of a rasp in your voice and, and would wheeze as you tried to breathe. For some, because of ulcers that would develop on their vocal cords, they would lose the ability to speak altogether. Along with the disfigurement physically came isolation. It, it came this separation from everyone else. You see, in, in, in biblical days, Lepers were considered and, and forced to become outcasts. It says this in Leviticus 13. As for the leper, his clothes shall be torn and the hair of his head shall be uncovered and he shall cry, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And in Numbers 4, it says, command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper. You shall send them outside of the camp. See, if you had leprosy and you were on the, on the windward side of a healthy person, you couldn't come within, within 50 yards of that person. If you accidentally even made contact and touched someone who didn't have leprosy, that person was now considered defiled and unclean. Imagine the thought of never being touched again. Imagine the thought of never being able to hug your child, never being able to, to reach out and, and to, to grab a friend by the hand or by the arm. As a parent, to never be able to put your arm around your son or daughter or to have your parent put their arm around your shoulder, to never embrace your spouse again. This was, this was it was devastating. It left them in this place of complete and total isolation and separation from their community. And I think that's why they're standing there and they're screaming, Jesus, Master. It's this group that has been isolated from everyone else. And they say, will you have pity on us? Will you have, will you have mercy on us? They stood at this distance, this set of outcasts, because they understand mud. They understand that, that they were in desperate need for a miracle. But I love the way that they cry out. When they cry out, Jesus, Master, what they're saying is that they recognize who Jesus is. They recognize who he was. They recognize what he could do in their lives. 
Look what it says in verse 14. He says, when, they saw, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, two things happen here. The first is, is check out their faith. Jesus doesn't heal them instantly. You see, there's other stories of Jesus healing people in the New Testament and in the Gospels. And, and, and there's so many times where it involves Jesus touching someone. It involves Jesus spitting and making mud and putting it on the blind guy's eyes. It, it involves some kind of a prayer that Jesus says, but there's none of those things happen in this instance. He just looks at the 10 guys and he says, go, go, go to the priests. And you have to be thinking, right? They've got to be wondering, what's the point of this? right? You didn't do anything. You didn't pray. You didn't touch us. You didn't heal us. We're, we're still suffering from this condition. And if we go to the priest, all that's going to happen are the priests are going to look at us and say, hey, you've got leprosy. You're unclean. You got to go and live outside of the camp. This is what's already happening to us. And yet they responded in faith. See, their obedience would determine the outcome in their lives. All 10 of them respond in faith. And as they are going on their way to go see the priest, Jesus heals them. Every time I read this story, it challenges my faith. How many times do I say, God, man, I, I want to see you do something. And God, as soon as I see you do something, then I'll respond to you. And I read this story and God says, no, that's not quite how it works, Donnie respond, and then I'll do something in your life. Here's the second thing that happens. Imagine this scene as they're walking, right? As they're walking towards the priest, they've left Jesus, and now all of a sudden their skin begins to clear up. Patches of skin begin to turn back to their, their natural color, right? It become healthy. Maybe for those of them that had lost their sight or, or maybe they had lost part of their vision, right? All of a sudden it's becoming to, to clear, to become clear again. All of a sudden they're beginning to see colors and they can see distances and their peripheral vision is coming back. Maybe, maybe parts of them begin to grow back, right? We don't know. I wonder what that's like. Did they just heal in the condition they're in? Or, or did some of their deformed, missing parts come back? Like the, the one who created them in the first place, did he recreate them in that moment? I imagine that immediately hands and fingers began to work and feet and toes began to move. Ten men who now knew the joy of health and strength and dignity. They could return to their homes and their families they, they could hug their wives. They could pick up their children. They could kiss their mothers because they were clean. Now, you ready for the shocker? Here's what it says in verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Thank you. It isn't amazing that one came back and say, said thank you. What's amazing in this story is that nine others didn't. Nine people whose bodies had been disfigured, whose lives had been ruined, who had become outcasts and isolated from everyone that they loved and cared about, now were changed. All of a sudden, everything was back to normal. Everything in their lives was completely different. And yet, in the midst of that, in the midst of that miracle, they didn't stop and come back and say thank you. See, it's possible to receive God's great gifts with an ungrateful heart. It's possible for God to do things in our lives all the time, and, and yet we have a thankless spirit. By referencing that the, the one who came back was a Samaritan, I love this because it's Luke's way of pointing out that God's grace is available to everyone, even this lowly Samaritan. See, here's what it means for us, that any of us, no matter how bad you think you've been, no matter how far away you feel from God, God's grace is available to you. God's grace is available to me. Now, you may read this and wonder, hold on, why does God need to thank you? Right? I mean, he's, he's God after all. He can do anything. Doesn't that seem a little petty that God would need us to come back and, and say thank you? Look what it says in verse 17. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? See, understand when you read those words, Jesus loves to hear us say 
thank you. And do you know why? It's not for him. It's for us. In fact, we've all experienced this, right? We, we've all felt the therapy that comes from those two powerful words, thank you. We've been on the side where we've received it and we all love to be appreciated for the things that we've done. But we also know that when we express those two words, it does something in our relationship, right? There's something powerful that happens in those two words. It might not be huge, it might not be deep, but there's something that says, you know what? I recognize what you did. I recognize your sacrifice. I recognize your love. Thank you for that. And it grows you closer to each other. See, this man took the time to return. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. What does this mean? Because when you read this, you may think, well, hold on, he was already healed, right? I mean, that's why he came back to thank Jesus. So he, he's already been healed. So why does Jesus say to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well? I thought he was already well. You, you see, the word for rise is a word that the early Christians would have recognized because it had, it had a connection to the word resurrection. Dead things coming back to life. See, he experienced so much more than just physical healing. We know that. Any time that you go through any kind of disfiguring or, or isolating disease or, or illness, it leaves you scarred, not just physically, but it leaves you scarred emotionally as well. See, Jesus heals not just his physical needs. He doesn't just meet those, but he meets his, his internal needs as well, his emotional needs, his spiritual needs. By being thankful, he, this guy gets it. He recognizes that, that, that Jesus not only healed him physically, but he healed his heart. He, he grew his faith. He's changed his life forever. And that's the way it happens in a grateful life. And we know this. We believe this. That's why as parents, we, we ask a question anytime our children receive a gift from anyone. We prompt our kids with, with the sentence, now, now what do you say, right? And, and we have this expectation. We know that our kids are supposed to simply respond by saying what? Thank you, right? Every kid knows that it's not really a question when their parents ask them, now what do you say? Parents aren't interested in, in the child's opinion on the matter, right? They automatically know that they're simply supposed to respond with two words, thank you. And even if our children don't feel gratitude, we want them to learn to be grateful for that knit sweater with the snowflake on it that grandma made or the, the Dora the Explorer footy pajamas that you got when you were in high school and you're a boy, right? <laughs> Just like children, there's times in our lives when we need to say thank you, even if we don't feel like it. Because one, it's the right thing to do. Two, it changes and softens our heart. And third, because the alternative to a, a life of gratitude is a life of ingratitude. It's a heart that is, is chronically discontent. It complains about everything so quick to judge other people's motives and intentions and actions. It's so dissatisfied with the things that happen in our lives. Now, don't look at your spouse or elbow them or, or text somebody and say, you got to get to church this weekend and, and hear this, right? But we know this. It's a, it's a person that lives with this, with this demanding spirit without any sense of awe or wonder or gratitude anymore. It's a, it's a heart of ingratitude. And day after day, what happens when, we're, we're, when we have this heart of ingratitude is that our heart grows smaller and colder and, and harder. And it's an incredibly miserable way for us to live our lives. And soon, soon what happens is that all we see around us is mud. Now, if you're honest, some of us as we sit here today are, are probably thinking, you know what, I, I may have that ungrateful heart. I often see myself as, as the victim. There's this bitterness that has crept in and it's, it's taken hold of me. This sense of entitlement that I have, that I deserve more than others. And guys, if I'm totally honest with you, it's so easy for me to slip into that same attitude myself. But the thing about gratitude 
is that you can't force yourself to be grateful. I've heard Mike say this before, that gratitude involves a way of seeing, perceiving, and understanding feelings in the heart and then expressing those feelings to someone else. See, here's what I believe is true. Thankfulness keeps us focused on the miracles and not the mud. So how do I open myself up to this heart of gratitude? How do I cultivate a a grateful heart in my life? I want to give you three observations from this story and, and then three action steps that I think if they are done every single day, we'll begin to develop this kind of heart in our lives. That if we're willing to follow them, that I believe you can cultivate a heart of thankfulness, heading into Thanksgiving, that regardless of your circumstances, no matter what comes in front of you, and maybe this daily habit becomes something that we carry with us. Maybe it begins to impact and change our entire life. It's not just something that we celebrate once a year because it's on a calendar, but it begins to shape and mold the way we respond to everything because thankfulness keeps us focused on the miracles that are happening around us every single day and not just the mud. So here's my first observation. God is good because he gives us free gifts. I love what these guys say to Jesus. Jesus, master, have pity on us. And I love that Jesus responds and heals them. And see, God's gifts for us are absolutely amazing. The problem is, is I miss them so much of the time. When we moved here a few months ago, we moved into a new house and Laura and I will go for a walk and we'll walk around our neighborhood and I'll see the landscaping on some of the other homes around us and and I'll feel guilty, right? I'll look at what they've done and how nice their place looks and and then I think about our place and how much I've slacked off on it and and, and, or maybe maybe it's when we're driving home and and there's that that next level community that's right across the road from us that has the the bigger houses and the nicer backyard and a a fire pit and a screened in porch. All, All these incredible things are Or maybe it's when I see the trucks and the Jeeps in the driveways of my neighbors and the jealousy starts to creep in. You see, I can so easily get caught up in the mud. We can lose sight of the miracles so quickly in our lives. When I catch myself beginning to to whine and and complain about finances, I have to stop my heart and, and reflect on all of the things that I have. I've never been accused of being an incredible dresser, but, but I'm actually wearing a, a lot of money. And, and I bet, I bet you are too. Um, this shirt that I'm wearing, I got it on Amazon. I got it on sale for $49 instead of 50. Um, but, I, but I got free shipping, right? So that's good. I saved on gas and all that kind of stuff. So, so I've got that. My jeans, my jeans cost about 55 bucks. I, I buy them from the same store. All of my jeans come from the same store, about 55 bucks. My shoes, uh, my shoes were $75. Some of you are saying, why? Um, <laughs> But they were a gift. My, my son and my wife, they, they gave them to me. They were custom designed by them for, for my birthday. I love them. Uh, my wedding ring, my wedding ring actually only cost about $15 because I had to replace the $100 one that I lost um, swimming in the ocean. But, but you put those two together. Uh, my socks, my socks are $7. $7 for socks you can't even see, um, but they're there under, underneath. My underwear, uh, we don't need to, but maybe resale value, 10 bucks. I, I don't know who would pay for it, but it doesn't matter. So here's the total, right? You add this up and, and it comes to $311. Now, you know how this puts things into perspective for me? Our family sponsors a boy named Wilson. Wilson lives in Tanzania. Wilson's family makes about $300 for an entire year. That simple math puts things quickly into perspective for me. Our family's had the privilege to go to a few different countries. We've had the privilege of taking students on mission trips all over. Um, Laura and I have had the privilege to go to Uganda. We, we've taken students to India. Uh, we took students and, and tie with us to Argentina and several times to Mexico. We've seen poverty. I've seen families that only have, if, if they're lucky, one meal to eat a day. I've seen parents who have sacrificed their meal for the day so that their kids have something to eat. They have one set of clothes. They don't have shoes And when we came back the first time from India, we came back and and I remember saying to Laura, I will never use the word starving again because I've never starved, not even close. I I mean, I I understand that. I I know what it means to be hungry. I know what it means to to go without for a little while. I definitely know what it means to whine and complain about what we have to eat, but I don't know what it means to starve. Now, do I say this to, to make you feel guilty? No. 
Not at all. I say this to help us realize how incredibly grateful and thankful we need to be for the incredible gifts that God has given us. And the reality is, is all of that stuff is literally just that. It's just stuff. And if we had none of that, we have this. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter two. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Do we deserve his kindness? No. Do we deserve his mercy? No. Do we deserve his, his forgiveness? Absolutely not. But his free gifts are a reason for us to be thankful every single day. Here's my second observation, is God is good because of his unconditional love. He heals all 10 even though nine of them don't return, don't ever say thank you as far as we know, he healed them anyways because he loved them unconditionally. See, the reason that God wants us to be thankful isn't for his sake, it's for ours. It's so that we understand that God loves me not for what I've done, but simply for who I am. God's love isn't based on my job, it's not based on my performance or my income. It's not based on the quality of my ministry. It's not even based on my appreciation. God's love for me isn't conditional. And there's nothing that I can ever do to earn his love. See, if God gave me his love in proportion to my gratitude, I'd be in trouble. It's a reason for us to be thankful for his gifts for his unconditional love, here's the third thing, is that God is good because he offers us real and eternal life. You see, in the midst of the craziness happening in this world, we can be thankful that God wants our future to include eternity with him. He offers us life both here and now and for eternity. Last weekend, we had over 25 people across our campuses that gave their lives to Jesus Christ, whose eternities were changed forever. John 10.10 10, says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, many of the people that I know, what we do is we tend to hang on to the eternity part and we forget that life starts now, that life is offered to us in these moments. We don't have to wait because Christ in us is the hope of glory. So many reasons. For us to be thankful. So many more that we could list and that we could talk about. But I want to give you three next steps, three things that you can begin to do this week to help you cultivate that grateful heart. And even if you're here today and you say, Donnie, I don't know that I believe in Jesus. I don't know if I believe in this whole God thing. First of all, let me say, we're so glad you're here. It's a great place for you to come and check out your relationship with him. But I think two of these things are things that you can do whether you believe in God or not. But for those of us that are here, most of us that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have no excuse ever to not be grateful. So many miracles that happen in our lives every single day. And yeah, there's always gonna be a little bit of mud, but there are so many things that if we begin to look up and recognize will change in our lives. So many things to be grateful for this week, this year, this life, because thankfulness keeps us focused on the miracles and not the mud. Here's the three things. First, will you just make a list? Take some time this week and just make a list of all of the things that you're thankful for. If you're done in three minutes or less, here's what I would say. Um, go to our website and re-listen to this message again um, because you missed something. Something got lost in translation, right, as we were going through this. But if you're on day three and you're still listing the things that you're thankful for, you get it. You get it. Right? Maybe it's not one list. Maybe you want to do one list. Maybe you want to spend a few minutes every day and just set an alarm on your phone and just begin writing. You'll be amazed at the names, the experiences, the things that you take for granted every single day that God will just begin to bring to your mind. Things will begin to flow out of you. God, thank you for, for the, the bite of food that I had today, for the air that I got to breathe. Thank you for music that I get to, to hear and, and feel for the face of a friend or a, a child or my spouse. So many things. And I, I think what happens is listing helps us to look up from the mud and see the miracles that are all around us. Here's the second thing. Would you take some time and, and just write a note or, or post something on Facebook or Instagram, however you want to do it, to someone every single day this week? 
Maybe what comes out of your list are a group of people that you are so thankful for, but you've forgotten about them, or, or it's been a long time since you've thanked them. And, and you begin to just write them some notes. You see, the more thankful we become, the more aware we become of the people in our lives and what it is that God's doing. Maybe it's a, an old teacher. Maybe it's a baseball coach or a boss, a, an employee. Maybe a neighbor that lives near you or used to live near you. Maybe a small group leader. Maybe you want to be preemptively grateful this Thanksgiving. And here's what I mean by that. What if you took a couple of moments at the beginning of every single day and wrote a thank you note to somebody that you're going to interact with that day? Maybe it's someone that you're going to be in class with at school or someone that's in the cubicle next to you at work. Maybe the barista that you're going to see at Starbucks when you stop in. What if you just wrote them a, a little note, just telling them how grateful you are for them? Maybe it's even that guy, that girl, the one that's really tough to be thankful for. Maybe even the relative that's going to come over Thursday. And you know that every story you share, they're going to trump your story with their way better version of your story. But what if you wrote them a thank you note and put it on their dinner plate? Maybe by doing it before you even have the encounter with those people, it would take some of the edge off. Imagine what God could do with that. Here's the third thing. And this one is, is the hardest which is why it can also be the most impactful. Colossians 3.17 says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the challenge for all of us that are followers of Jesus. That whatever you do, whatever you say, it should always be done to give God the glory and it should be done with a thankful heart. I mean, Paul covers it, right? I mean, there, there's nothing left here by saying whatever you do or, or whatever you say. It's enough said. He, he drops the mic or drops his pen after he wrote the letter. Whatever it is, it's, it's complete. It's done. Everything that we do, everything that we say, it should always bring honor and glory to God and it should always be done with a thankful heart. I'm not here yet. I am so far from being here, but I want to be. And I want you to be here too. Because the sooner you get there, the easier it will be for me to be thankful for you and, and the cycle will just continue on. Right? Can you imagine if we, if we got this together? If we began to live this way this year, imagine what it would do to our lives if we began to become increasingly grateful for the incredible things that God does all around us every single day. Imagine the difference it would make in your family. I guarantee the way that you talk to each other would change. Conflict would go down to, if not non-existent, to real close. It would change how you spend your time. It would change how you spend your money. It would change how you love and treat each other. Imagine the difference it would have in your community, right? When, when you're at your child's soccer game or baseball game or when you're at that company function, if you were to, whatever you say, whatever you do, it's to give God the glory and the honor and you do it with a thankful heart, uh, people would notice something different about you. They would look at you and say, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's, what's going on with you? It would impact lives. Imagine what it would do at your job or at school. What if you were the one this week that came back to God at the end of every single day and said, thank you. Thank you for who you are and thank you for what you have done in my life. See, here's what I believe would happen. This one thing alone, if we began to do that collectively, this is the thing that could help us reach the triangle and change the world and accomplish the vision that God has given to us as a church. Let's pray. God, I thank you. So many things to be thankful for. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the gifts that you pour out in our lives every single day. God, thank you for your unconditional love. I couldn't earn it. I don't have to earn it. You gave it freely to me and to each of us. God, thank you for that. Thank you that you give us life now to the fullest. But Father, we also know that we have the hope of eternity after this life with you. God, thank you for those things. God, will you help me? Help me to look past the mud. There's always gonna be mud. Sometimes mud's okay because it helps me appreciate the miracles. God, help me to see who you are and what you're doing all around me every single day. And God, help me in whatever I say and whatever I do to give you glory and, and to do it with a heart that's thankful. God, help us to be that kind of church. 
And God, use us however you see fit to impact the lives of people around us. We love you and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.